hi everyone. Um, I'm super happy to be here. Um, I've been using you know Ruby and Rails for ages, and it feels great to be speaking in RailsConf. Um, so, as Caleb did yesterday, you should follow me on Twitter. Um, I don't know, like you followed him, so I think you can just follow me just as well. Um, so, um, yes, I'm actually Italian. Um, I can speak Italian. I can cook like Italian dishes. I think that makes me like pretty much Italian. Um, I started doing Ruby in 2010. Um, in the last couple of years, I've been doing mostly JavaScript. I got really interested in machine learning, and I climb a lot. So I'm not a good climber. I just climb a lot. So I think we're trying to organize like a climbing session uh, tomorrow. So if anyone is interested, just like follow me on Twitter and then hit me up. Um, okay, cool. So yes, um, right now I'm working in a company in London which is called Erlang Solutions, and they were very kind to send me here. So I'm going to, you know, tell the world about how awesome they are because they're the first company who actually believed in Erlang as a technology in 1999, which seems like, you know, a century ago. I guess it is. Um, <laughs> And of course, they love Elixir. They love all sorts of like technologies which like run on the beam. So React, RabbitMQ, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, okay, that was like you know my business blob. Um, okay, so my goal today is to do some live coding. So let me just first ask you. <coughs> oh no, something. VLC is crashed. Clear. Can you guys in the back see all this? Could it be bigger? Big, a little bit bigger? More? Good? I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> no? Is it okay? Less? Okay, I'm just gonna go for this, but if you can't see it, like, let me know. Um, but before I start, I just want to show you my desktop background. I think it's really nice because there's this like obvious like Photoshop like on the in the front. It's like it's just like such a high render quality. And then you have like these two guys in the back. They're not even like looking at each other. Like, what's the point? I don't know. <laughs> but but I, um, I hope like you're familiar with the movie. Like if you're not familiar with the movie, raise your hand. <laughs> Keep it raised, please. <laughs> Well, okay, I can get it off now. Um, anyways, so uh, what I wanted to do today, first of all, there's like this amazing web M, which I showed you before, which is this guy like playing the, fu the flute. But there's also a train CSV file, and this is actually like real historical data of the Titanic passengers. So there's 892 lines, uh, minus one for the header, so it's like 891 passengers. And for each one of these passengers, we have uh, this information. So the passenger ID, uh, whether they survived, their passenger class, their name, their sex, the age, the number of siblings and spouses, the number of parents and children, uh, which ticket they bought, the fare, so how much they pay for it, the cabin, and where, where they embarked on the ship. So what we're going to do today is to well, I have to admit it, like, mainly the main goal is just like, to make sure that the movie didn't lie to us. <laughs> so that was like, my main like, scientific goal when I started on this adventure. Um, so what we're going to do is to use some Python libraries. Uh, I think the guy who spoke before me, he already explained like, why Python is the way to go when you're doing machine learning. And I think he's right. So. Um, they're just like some really amazing libraries, and I hope today I can show you just like how good they are. Um, so yeah, let's start. Um, I'm going to create a file which is called visualize.py, and we're going to use this library which is called pandas, which is an amazing name because everyone loves pandas, and it's like one of the best libraries I've ever seen for just like dealing with you know CSV files, for example. And also we're going to import mat plot lib, pyplot, which is a visualization uh, library. 
Um, there's this concept in Pandas of data frames. So whenever you're loading your CSV, it will just be converted into a Pandas data frame. So I'm just going to call it like DF. And then you use Pandas, you just do read CSV. You pass the file, and he will automatically read it off. So for example, if we wanted to see like a little bit more about you know, like the distribution of the survival rates, we just do print.df survived. This is like automatically created by the library. And then we can just do value counts. OK? Uh, feel free to interrupt me like there's like anything like unclear. OK? So if I just run this, you'll see, oh, OK, of all these lines we had, um, we only have like 332 survivors, and the rest, unfortunately, like, did not survive. But it would be nice if we could actually see this, right? So um, to do that, we just do plot. We say like what kind of uh, you know, graph we want. In this case, we want a bar. And I'm just going to set some opacity. And then in the end, um, actually, I should create the graph first. Um, so I'm just going to go figure. And it's plt dot uh, figure and <coughs> here. Just pass a fixed size. Um, 18, six. OK, good. And here I'm just going to do plt dot show. So hopefully this is going to work. And here it is. OK, so uh, in two lines, we basically transform like this information into this graph. And of course, as humans, we can't really reason too well with these numbers. So I want to see the percentages. And in order to do that, I just have to write here, um, normalize true. And if I do that and run Python, you'll see this is what happens. So we can see that actually on our data set, there's like a 40% people which survived, and 60% unfortunately did not. OK? Um, but what's better than the single graph is to have loads of graphs. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to use this subplot to grid, which basically creates a grid of subplots. Does that make sense? I don't know. Um, but um, the only thing we need to do is just like to set a title for this thing. And we're going to say, this is survived. Mm. And basically, like, this structure just means like this is a rectangle, um, two rows, three columns, and this is the first cell, right? So if I run this, um, you'll see that it basically just like, puts it like, up there. Um, I really hate the fact that like, by default, the graphs like, are not full screen. So I have like, some really nice code, two lines of code, which will do that. So I'm just going to paste them in. OK? Um, OK, cool. So now we can keep making more graphs. And I'm just going to use like, the good old like, copy-paste. So what we want to do now is to take a look at, um, we want to see if there is a relationship between um, the survival rate and the age. So there is this, this tool, which is called a scatter plot, which will show you this. And the only thing we need to do, uh, let me just like, remove uh, these two lines. OK, so we take a look at the survival rate, and we compare it to the age. And I'm going to pass a little bit of opacity here as well, just because otherwise the dots would just get like too clumped together. And here I'll say this is um, the uh, age with regards to the survival rate. OK? And if I print this, we'll see that actually this is quite unexpected, at least like for me when I started doing this. Like there is no like apparent like age connection between the survival rates. So uh, you can see like the main like lumps of people are between 20 and 40, both on the left hand side and on the right hand side. Uh, as I said before, one means um, survived, and mm, zero means passed. And if, if we take a look like, a bit more closely, we can see that like older people like have you know uh, passed a little bit more. And there's like younger people here which might have survived. But other than that, I think the distribution like still like doesn't allow us to, you know, like any conclusion. Okay. Um, something else we might want to take a look at is just like the distribution of the passenger classes. So here I'm just going to do this, change this to oh no, two or two. And here instead of survive, just going to passenger class. And same here. Okay? 
And if I run this, we'll see that most of the uh, passengers were um, in the third class. Then we have people in the first class and people in the second class. And I think this is quite like what we expected because you know there were like more people like you know um, which like couldn't afford like the more expensive tickets. Um, something we might want to look at is the relationship between the age of the passengers and the class like they, they were that they were able to buy. And in order to do that, um, I'm going to do something which will probably make you very, very afraid if you work with HTML at some point, like tables, call span, anyone? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, good, call span is rocks. Anyways, so uh, we're going to use this feature of Python, which is a list comprehension. So just gonna say, it's basically uh, one, two, three, dot each, right? And for each one of those, we're going to want to display the age when <coughs> the passenger class is equal to a certain number. So that when you're using these square brackets, what you're doing is just like to filter, um, like you want to extract the age, but only for the rows which passenger class was X, okay? And for each one of those, I'm going to create a new graph. In this case, it's going to be called a kernel density estimation. Uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia afterwards what it actually means, but it looks pretty, so that's why I've added it. Um, and here the title is going to be age uh, with regard to uh, P class. And I'm just going to add a little legend to the graph so that uh, you can actually tell what is going on. Second, third, okay. And if I run this, you'll see this is a really nice graph, right? Anyone agrees with me? Anyone disagrees, <laughs> most importantly? Okay, so we can see that for the third class passengers, um, the, uh, they're like way younger, their, their average um, age is 20 years old, and for the second class, uh, second class passengers, they get around 30 years old, and the first class passengers, they're around 40. So as they get older, they get richer, and therefore they can you know, like buy more expensive tickets. Um, since I was really interested in understanding more of the movie, um, I've actually figured out that there is like, you know, like a glaring like historical like, you know, um, mistake, uh, which is that I discovered that the boat, the, the ship, actually made two stops. So it started in Southampton, but it actually made other two stops. And we can take a look at the embarked column. And I'll just put in one, two. I think this is okay -ish. Um, and if I run this, you'll see um, that 70% of our data set embarked on Southampton in uh, England, but then the ship made a pit stop um, in France, in Cherbourg, and then it actually made another stop in Ireland, in Queenstown. So, yeah, if you're like Titanic fans, I think this is like a good piece of trivia. Um, <laughs> No, like at parties especially, I think it's quite cool. Um, but I, I think it's quite nice, you know, like when you uh, have these like 15 lines of Python code and you can actually like drill down the data set and get, you know, try to put some of these um, values like in correlation and try to just like see what's going on. Um, and, you know, instead of building a prototype and taking you, you know, at least a week or something, here using like these libraries just like takes you five minutes, I think. Um, I think it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, something which is missing from these graphs is the gender of the passenger. And the reason why that is missing is because I think it's quite important. So I think it deserves um, a dashboard on its own. So I'm going to do some nice copy paste. Gender, pi, copy everything, delete this. Um, and actually, I don't really need most of this stuff. I'm going to comment this stuff and just leave this, okay? So uh, what I want to do now is just like to take a look at the difference of survival rates between uh, men and women, right? Um, but I want to make more graphs because more graphs are more awesome. So <laughs> um, I'm just going to do this quickly. And here, I want to show this like survivor rate, but only when the sex is um, male, okay? And here I'll write men survived, and then I'll do the same thing here, 
and I'll just say uh, sex is female, and here will be uh, women survive, okay? To make things like a little bit nicer, just like create a color just for female, um, and I'll just make it, you know, uh, something just like different. Um, color, female, color. Um, and I think this looks good. And we can see here, um, like the graphs like have like pretty much the same shape. So we can see like in total there's like 40% people survived. The men, they have like a 20% survival rate. And the women looks quite similar, unless you look at the numbers like underneath. Probably you can't really see, but uh, if I zoom, it says one, <laughs> right? So actually, 70% of the women survived, like at least like in this current data set. Like by itself, this information doesn't mean that much because you know if you think there is a room with a hundred men and one woman, one woman, sorry, um, like this information by itself is not really significant. So maybe we can just like take a look if that's the case or not. And to do that, um, we just like take the same code we used here and just say. Um, just like show me the sex, okay? And we can see that, oh, I think I made a mistake somewhere. Mm, I should have updated this to three. Okay, and we can actually see that, okay, there's like more men, but the difference is not that big. There's like a 40%, 35%, so I think the data set is quite balanced in that way. Like it's not, you know, an inconsistency of the data set. So there must be something else, right? Um, before we looked at the passenger distribution correlating that with the age, and we can do the same thing and correlating the passenger class with their survival rate. So I'm just going to uncomment this code we had before. And here, instead of the age, I'm just going to take a look at the survival rate. And I think the rest can just remain the same apart from uh, this. And I'm just going to make the cold span larger. <laughs> Every time I see cold span, just like, it's funny. Uh, and here we have the graph, where you can see on the left, uh, the passengers in the third class, they're like really like, you know, in such a bad spot. And instead, the passengers in the first class, they have a good survival rate. So I think this is quite cool because we can see like on the first row, there's this like difference between the genders. And here, there's a difference between the passengers class. So maybe what we can do is to try to see, oh, maybe if we try to combine the first two rows and there's like some like striking um, you know, feature of the data. So in order to do that, uh, I'm just going to do copy this. Um, don't, don't worry about the code, like, uh, I'll put it online. I, I think it's already online, actually. So, um, so what I'm going to do is, I want to take a look at the survival rate of all the men, but I also want to add another condition. So I'm just going to use this end, and say that the P class is equal to uh, one. And here I just say, uh, first class men survived, okay? And then I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm just going to change this to one, to one, and this to three. And this is going to be third class man survived. Um, and if I run this, you'll see that this pretty much confirms our like suspicions before. Uh, the, the first class man have a 35% survival rate, and the third class man had a uh, little over 10%. So if you're a third class man, like you're not doing great. Um, instead, if we wanted to do the same thing for women, um, I'm just going to copy this. There's a lot of copy paste in this talk, as you can see. Well, one could say the same thing about programming in general. Um, and so there's a color, which is a female color. And here I'm just going to say uh, women. Yeah, and the last one is going to be um, female in like third class, okay? So third class. Okay, cool. And I think this is quite striking because you can see that in the first class women, 
uh, I had to check the data set actually because like when I first ran this, I couldn't really believe it. But like I think like there's 78 like first class women and 77 of them survived in the data set. And instead, if you're a third class women, uh, the distribution is like more even, it's like 50-50. But I think like especially given my initial you know like scientific goal of this exploration. I can say that the movie is actually confirmed, so there is some like historical accuracy like to the movie, because this third class man would be Jack, and this first class woman would be Rose. So it's not really a surprise <laughs> that Jack, you know, perished and Rose survived. You know, it's not like you know a fictionary, uh, like a fictional you know mechanism. It's like actually how things went. So we can take a look at the picture again. You know. um, um, okay, but as you can see, like it's super nice to be able to do this like data slicing and just like visualize these things like in a little bit of a like easy way. Uh, but what would be even cooler is to try to run some predictions, right? We all want to be wizards one day. Um, so what we're going to do is just to create like the most basic heuristic that we can do, which is just like to predict if you're a woman, you're going to survive, and if you're a man, you're gonna die. I'm sorry for all the male audience like in the room. Um, so we're just going to create a new file. Um, actually, maybe I'm just going to create uh, call it like predict pi and import pandas as pd. And here I'm just going to create like uh, call this data frame train because it's what in machine learning call like the training set, like the initial data that you use to build the model, right? So here I'm going to do read CSV, um, train.csv. And what I want to do is to create a new column. So I'm going to do that just by doing this. So in this way, it's going to create a new column called uh, hip for hypothesis, but it's like a cooler hypothesis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> and I'm going to initialize the whole column to zero. Except that I want like that when some condition applies, I want that column to be one. So I'm going to use this function which is called lock. And this function takes like, mm, well, it's not really a function, but anyways, this thing takes two arguments. The first one is the condition, and the second one is the column you want to update. So the condition is df sex equal equal female. And the column I want to update is hypothesis and I'm going to set that to one, okay? And so in this way, basically, we created our first guess of like how to predict the outcome that we want to predict. But now we ha want to check like how accurate is our prediction. So I'm going to do like something quite similar. I'm just going to create a new column called result, and inside the result, I'm going to check the survival rate against our hypothesis. Um, and here I'm going to set the result. Okay, and basically now like we can do the same thing we did before. We just like extract the result back. We run value counts on it, and I'll just run it like this for now. Okay. Uh, no, the f is not defined. I think it's because I called it train. Uh, train. Sorry. Okay, this should be right. And we can see that. Uh, this thing like was correct 701 times and was wrong 190 times, which in percentages means something which I can't remember, but I think it's around like 70%, 78%, okay? So if you consider that if you were only guessing, you'd have an accuracy of like 50%, you just improved your heuristic by 28%, which is like a very simple guess, okay? And you got to that guess because you took a look at the data, you tried to understand a little bit uh, how the data works. And, you know, of course, if you use like more advanced algorithms, you'll be able to improve that number. Um, but I think it's quite cool just like to see the huge difference of when you have like a m basic understanding of the data and when you don't. Um, so I think this is cool, but something which is cooler is to let the machine do the, all, like, the whole thing, right? Um, luckily, there's a set, like it's an ensemble of libraries which is super well known, which is called scikit-learn. And inside scikit-learn, there's basically so many machine learning models, 
So what we're going to do is to use a model which is called a linear model. So I'm going to do a linear dot pi. And I just want to quickly explain you like how a linear model works, right? So if you see like a graph like this, um, and like the, all these are data sets, um, like the data points, we as humans will guess, okay, the data is exhibiting this sort of trend, right? And I think this is quite simple. Like, you know, you ask it, you know, to my cousin who's like five years old, who could probably do it. Um, but the problem is that in real life, the data sets have way more features than two. So, for example, if you're doing image recognition, every different pixel of the image is a different feature. So if you're analyzing images which are 50 by 50 pixels, you're facing a problem which has 2,500 dimensions. So if I'm going to ask you to solve the same problem in 2,500 dimensions, I don't really know who is able to do that. But the advantage of having a numerical approach which does the same thing is that, apart from performance, of course, uh, the, the numerical problem doesn't care. The, numer the numerical problem would just like solve the problem just as well. And I think that's why like, most people think that machine learning is quite you know, um, scary. I mean, because it tries like to condense this sort of like human knowledge into some number somewhere. And there's like not a really good explanation for us for like what that means. Uh, but no, I don't really want to scare you with my this topic like future tales. So I'm just going to import pandas again as uh, PD. Uh, no, train.pd uh, read CSV train.csv. Um, I'm just going to show you, I, I said I was going to live code, but I actually lied. And there's some, <laughs> there's some like helper functions I wrote before because I didn't really want to bore you with these details. But basically, of course, one of the like, things you always have to do with data is to clean it up. So for example, in this case, some column, like some rows don't have the fair information, some rows don't have the age information, so I'm just like filling them back up with like the average value. And then another thing is like most of these numerical approaches work really well with numbers, but it can't work with strings. So I'm just converting the idea of the sex to a number. So if you're male, you're going to be zero. And if you're female, you're going to be one. And the same thing applies for the embarked information. Okay. So here, what I'm going to do is to import these utils. Um, and just do um, utils.cleanData train. Okay. And uh, how most of these algorithms works, uh, work is that you basically you tell the algorithm, this is, these are all the inputs, and there is one output. And the inputs are called features. So what you're going to do is to extract these features. So let's say I want to use the passenger class, the age, the um, sex, um, no? and let's say the fare, OK? And I'm going to extract those values. And then I want a target which is the survived information. Uh, and I'm going to extract that as well, okay? And since this algorithm is going to try to decide if this row is going to go into the survived bucket or the diseased bucket, it's usually called a classifier. And here I'm going to use uh, scikit-learn. So from scikit-learn, I'm going to import this linear model. And this linear model has this little uh, thing which is called logistic regression, okay? Which is basically the same thing that which I described before, of just like trying to figure out like which is like a good line to separate two data sets. Um, and it's super simple. You take this classifier, you say, okay, fit uh, these features against this target, and then print me the scores uh, of um, these features against this target, okay? And if I run that, it's like 79%. And as you can see, like, I didn't tell the algorithm anything at all. He just like, he figured out, like, okay, these are the inputs. This is the output that this guy asked me to figure out. I'm just going to, you know, do my best. And the model that he constructed was like a little bit better than our naive intuition. Of course, the linear model isn't always like the right answer because we know in real life there are problems which are not linear. So if I asked you to describe this data, you wouldn't say it's this, right? I mean, unless like you have a thing for like straight lines. Uh, <laughs> maybe you'd do something like this, which is not too bad. I'm, I'm not judging, but 
I would say that usually you'd go for something like this, right? So uh, luckily, like most like machine learning experts, they recognize this uh, hatred for straight lines as well, and they created this module just called preprocessing, where you can basically you can manipulate your features and transform them into their sort of like polynomial transformation. So basically you can make them quadratic if you want to. And it will just like take your data and, com and combine them and multiply them together and create new columns for you. Mm. So what I'm going to do is just to create one of these like transformers. Um, polynomial features. And you have to pass like the degree. So in this case I'm going to just to try with the quadratic. And now we can transform our existing features uh, using this fit transform of features, okay? So basically we had these features and in this way we transformed them into their sort of like uh, quadratic versions. And now we do the exact same thing. We just like tell, okay, fit these poly features against the target and then print me the score of this other classifier. Poly features target, okay? And we see like it, this, this thing already like improved a little bit. Um, usually, uh, you can see that it's because I, I think like the mental model is now the algorithm is trying to match against like data which behaves in a quadratic way. Uh, usually, if you add like more information, like the algorithm will behave better. So, for example, I can add the number of uh, parents and children, the number of siblings and spouses. Um, I think this should be enough. And let me try to run it again. And you can see that given more information to the algorithm, the algorithm is able to like, you know, make better predictions, okay? Um, and all this in like 20 lines of code, I think it's pretty cool. Um, how much time do I have left? Six minutes, okay, cool. So I just want to show you one more thing, uh, which is uh, what are called decision trees. So basically there are these algorithms which are, which are going to build these decision trees. So for each row in our CSV, it's going to run through a series of questions. And then depending on the outcome of these questions, we're going to classify our little row. So uh, let me just do some good copy paste. Um, predict uh, tree, pi, and no, I don't think my paste worked. Uh, let me try again. Yes, that's better. Um, and instead of linear model, we're going to import tree. Um, I think we don't need this. So I'm just going to change this to um, decision tree classifier. All the rest remains unchanged. And in, in this way, the algorithm is going to build a tree and try to match that. And if you're a normal person, you see this number, you're like, wow, this is so cool. But if you're a software developer, you know there's something wrong. Because you, like we all know there's no such thing as a free lunch, you know. Mm. So 98% is like way too good. It can't be, right? Um, so basically what the algorithm did in this case uh, is like a phenomena in um, machine learning which is called overfitting. So basically we're passing some data and the algorithm is trying to find a very complex solution which matches against all the data points. And that's why, like, afterwards, when we try to ask him, oh, how's, how are things going? And he's like, yeah, everything's great. You know, I, I, I got it, bro. You know? Uh, but when, when you see the solution, you're like, nah, I think you might be, you know, using. Um, luckily, like, the scientists recognize this problem as well. And it's, like, quite, like, a big problem in machine learning, this problem of overfitting. So we have to figure out ways to make the machine learn like the generalized properties of the system, not the specific properties. So in scikit-learn, there's this little thing which is called model selection. And if you use this model selection thing, you can basically say, um, okay, take this model and try to hide some data from this algorithm so that the algorithm builds like a model which is more gener generic, you know? And I'm going to need to use this function which is called cross vault score um, you can like um, explore later what that actually means. Um, but I'm just going to pass the features, the target. You have to pass like a scoring methodology, which I'm just going to pass accuracy. This is not good, like don't do it, but I think it's just like simple enough. 
Um, and I'm going to say, okay, rerun this process 50 times. So basically, like this thing is going to subsample randomly the data set, hide some stuff from, from, from the algorithm, rerun it again, and try to see how it behaves, right? So if I print this, uh, scores, print, scores, I mean, whoa, 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 that's not how Python works, I'm afraid. <laughs> it would be nice, but. Um, and, and you see, like, if I try to hide data from the algorithm, the actual average of the scores is quite abysmal. And this is like what we expect, because we are trying to build a solution which is like too specific, so it can't really work. Um, the good news is that there is a way like, to fix this, and it's basically to tell the algorithm, uh, well, don't be too smart. So what I'm going to do is to, first of all, pass a random state uh, to the algorithm, and then basically specify a max depth. So if you imagine this as a tree, the tree won't, will never go more than six levels, okay? And then I'm going to pass like this other little thing which is called sample split, which basically controls uh, how many elements have to get into a branch before the tree decides to split like, into a sibling. Uh, it's not super important, but I think it's nice. And if I just like rerun the same code again, you'll see the difference. You'll see that like the initial performance like wasn't as great, but the general average is much better. Okay, so basically in this way we've created a model which is like more resilient because like in this way we're cheating before we're just like passing all the data, but in real life you'll train the model and then score it on you know new data. So it has to work well for like data it's never seen before. Um, and I still think this is like quite weird. So uh, luckily there is a really nice, um, no wait, it's called tree. And there's like a really nice utility inside the tree um, library which is to export to a graphviz file. So actually, let me just double check how I do that. Um, okay, gotcha. So um, you just pass the tree, you pass the feature names, which I don't have, so I'm going to have to add that, and you set like the out file to uh, a dot file, okay? So I'm just going to cut this uh, to uh, feature names. Feature names equals thing I just cut. I think this should work. Um, okay, cool. So if I, um, oh, no, control Z. If I list, there is a file which is called tree dot. If I paste it, just like a little bit weird, but uh, I can convert it to a PNG file. Um, tree dot into a tree dot PNG. And if I open this folder, you'll see that there is a Really nice graph now. And this is the actual tree that the algorithm built. This is just like visualized. Um, and these are like all the decisions that the tree does in order to classify your row. Is if, if you can see, like the, the top level decisions are the most important decisions, right? And it's not a coincidence that the first decision that the algorithm makes is, is the passenger, man or woman. And then the one immediately after that is, oh, is it a child, like is like it's the age of this passenger like less than 6.5. And the other immediate decision is what's it, what is the pa like the passenger class, okay? So basically the algorithm figure out a lot of things which we figure out like on our own. Um, but as I said before, this thing can do it like on, uh, you know, a thousand dimensions. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. Wow. <laughs>